Our next and final speaker for today's summit is Priscilla Kinney, who will be giving us a talk on environmental and community stewardship. Priscilla Kinney is of Paiute Shoshone Chicana heritage and was born in Owens Valley in California. She carried her passion for plants and herbal medicines to Humboldt State University, where she received a degree in rangeland resource science. She has worked for the nonprofit United Indian Health Service which is a local tribal health care system in Northern California, and she was engaged in the Food is Good Medicine program, a culturally centered nutritional program consisting of educational materials on local indigenous foods. Currently, she works as a substitute teacher at Jack Norton Elementary, teaching kindergarten through third grade and invigorating the growth of the gardens on campus. Priscilla, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen at this point. And uh, get ready. <laughs> I apologize, I'm gonna get this in full screen. Let's see, just one moment, I'm trying to get this uh, in a PowerPoint show. <laughs> All right, well, that's not working as wonderful as I wanted it to, so I'll just start from here. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Okay, oh, it looks like I went forward there without meaning to. Okay, again, um, I'm gonna do a little talk about community and environmental stewardship. My name is Priscilla Kinney. Um, I wanna say thank you very much for giving me the space to be able to share with all of you. Uh, on my experiences working um, with both um, environment and community. Um, speaking to the heart of what is at stake for, for all human beings and other living beings is our relationship with water, fire, land, and air. Our relationship, our values, our institutions and policies must be in line with these basic elements that life requires. We see this place and point of where we want to be collectively a place of clean water, land, and air, access to healthcare, housing, education, economic opportunity. This must take collective thinking, action, and pathways of healing. Any regenerative work and environmental justice needs to be in alignment with social justice. So some of the questions I think about myself, I'm thinking as I'm you know, still diving in this work, it's, it's always continuing. It's, how do we make ourselves think about this work and plan for others, plan for others besides for our own well being? How do we make communities that are sustainable and are able to create their own healthy spaces? Um, I feel like that, that big step is uh, to, to shift from self to community. Um, globally, we've all experienced to a certain extent, uh, colonization. And it's the process of being colonized has uprooted us from our lands, from our culture, from our languages that have, um, where it's coded with our environment and gives us instructions on how to function the best way in that space. Um, some work I've leaned into by Sean Jinwright. He uh, does a lot of work with youth and uh, healing engagement and how, how we uh, work with trauma. Um, a good quote I found from him is, if trauma is collectively experienced, this means that we must consider the environmental context that caused the harm in the first place. By only treating the individual, we address part of the equation, leaving the toxic systems, policies, and practices neatly intact. Um, so just here, I have a little picture of my niece and my daughter. 
uh, both gathering traditional teas in our Paiute homelands. These are teachings that they received from me, that I received from my mother and she received from her mother. Um, so looking through a holistic community perspective, um, indigenous people throughout the world, we make up about 5% of the population, but we, uh, we are, responsible for a lot of the biodiversity that we see now. And some of that work is because of the generations of work that has happened. Um, and it's only now being recognized in uh, science today. Um, the future of our planet lies in indigenous ways of living on earth, says John Waterhouse, indigenous people scholar at Oregon Health and Science University. As a global community, we have lost our way. We forgot what it means to have a relationship with the land. And um, I feel like that's a big step in our healing is separating ourselves by, how should I say this? A big part of our healing is just rec recognize ourselves as a human being and the people next to us as human beings that we all actually need the same things and that we all live in this great global community and what does that what do we need in order to continue to to live in this in this way um i believe our future it needs to develop workforce develop capacity for us to be able to uh take on these roles and these tasks of being sustainable, of being regenerative and healing all at the same time. And it has to happen on the local levels. Um, for example, for us, so much of our healthcare, our education uh, has to come from outside of the community. Uh, in addition to some of the foods that are um, either fish hunted or grown in our area, uh, so much of it leaves our our area in order to sustain grocery markets out on the coast. In addition to that, so much of our water from the river gets diverted to um, central and Southern California for big ag without considering um, the implications uh, to the river system and the generations of people that have you know, survived um, so looking at this holistic, um, perspective, I think like walking into it, uh, firsthand, seeing this in my own community and being an organizer at, at a certain point, um, we created a lot of, uh, local level actions. And some of these actions have I would say also multiple generations. Uh, Undiming the Klamath River movement has been uh, occurring for multiple generations as early as the 70s when um, the National Guard was called on Yurok tribal members fishing on the Klamath River and people's fish were uh, taken from them, people were clubbed and that response uh, led to having Indian people from all over the country come to the Klamath River to do a fishing. And it's not something that you hear very often in, in history, but it's that's why we have what we have is because of those grandparents that fought so hard for the river, we're still doing this fight. Um, also uh, developing cultural burns, that's, that began back in uh, 2014 uh, through organizing. Uh, we had an organizer go within our community, uh, have conversations one-to-ones with people and asking them, you know, what is something that you envision, something that you would see make your community better and safer? Um, and what we came out with is we wanted to see more burns. Um, we live in a very forested area and we need to have our safe spaces. But in addition to that, 
we need to burn in order to continue continue cultural practices uh, such as gathering for uh, baskets and food and, and other medicines um, to have these healthy plant communities it requires us to do the burns and because we've been restricted for multiple generations we have an accumulation of um, old growth. And so that organizing, um, it's been really beautiful. We've, we've been able to train people in our local community as well as uh, globally. We've had people come from all over the country, Spain, Australia, to come learn how to burn. Um, in addition to that, some of my, my firsthand organizing work, I was able to uh, increased civic engagement uh, within the, the tribal elections and being able to put pressure on uh, the Yorok Tribal Council addressing our local water sanitation issues. Um, other things I've seen are our local tribes. We are in a very tribally diverse area in Northern California and we had um, Three different tribes uh, come together to fight within one school district uh, in with the AC, ACLU um, to talk about the funding that our school district is getting and not necessarily spending the way that the community needs it to. Um, and out of all that organizing actually came out a uh, new nonprofit that's called uh, Building Structures That Build Lives. And so we just are starting to create new systems as we see them. And a big part of all this work is being able to tell the story. Um, if we don't tell the story, then someone else will tell it for us. Um, and I feel like in all this work, uh, imagination has a big, big space. Um, I would like to take a minute just to share a little uh, Tibet from Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldy, who is um, a Native woman professor at Humboldt State University. Um, people will say to me, like, there's really a good dream that you have right there. Well, I'm like, how? Or, oh, <laughs> someday we won't actually need any fossil fuels. And then they're like, that's a really good dream you have, but that's impossible. But what I tell people now is like, you know, you have to stop thinking about things that are impossible. What we have to say out loud, what we want the world to be. In indigenous context, we say nothing can become until you speak it into being. And you, when you first have to tell a story about it, you get to open people's imaginations of what it could look like. Um, Dr. Kutcha is um, working a lot with uh, cultural revitalization in, in, in alignment with environmental justice uh, and land and the land back uh, campaign. And so I feel our, our future uh, needs to really be rooted in restorative justice practices, indigenous, black, Latinx, Asian, LGBT, LGBTQT, poor and disabled people and voices need to be at the center of creation of systems change and building political power and capacity building for indigenous communities. Um, I think that's gonna be critical for us to be able to uh, steer these, these networks uh, effectively and to be able to build uh, stronger collaborative relationships. We need to have um, that training and that's, ongoing uh, returning land back and removing dams um, that's something that i see right here locally is land coming back to tribal people and uh, dams coming off of the klamath river another big part of our future that needs to be um, central is healing uh, healing engagement must be a part of our plan and as an intentional political action uh, caring for myself is not self-indulgent. It is self-preservation and it is an act of political warfare. Um, healing and well-being are fundamentally political and not clinical. 
This means that we have to consider the ways in which the policies and practice and political decisions harm young people in addition to, um, to all people, um, but young people are the ones that have to make the most sense out of it because they are, they are so innocent and it is our job to create that, uh, that structure for it, to, for it to change for and for them to realize what systems they're coming into. If by doing that, they, they'll be better armed to take on these changes that they need to. Um, in closing, uh, I think about the late LaDonna Brabel and things that she had said, and I feel we are stepping into these times that we're in a process of healing and I think, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to end. I don't think it's going to end. We have only just begun. We are fulfilling prophecy now. The prophecies are people told a hundred years ago are coming to pass. I see them before my eyes. Nothing is going to go back. We can only change. My whole idea is to have the world change the worldview that maybe we can live with the earth instead of destroying the earth. And I'm hoping that all people will get that message. Um, I think as far as indigenous community, communities, that's the biggest lesson that we can all take is how can we live in this space without taking more, more than what we need. And, and if we have extra, then we ought to share it with our, our neighbors and um, other community members that are without. Um, so I will go ahead and take a pause. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Priscilla, for your presentation. Um, we are moving on to the Q&A section of the program. So if you have any questions to ask Priscilla, please write them in the chat. We'll have about 10 minutes. Or, you're, sorry, muted, we'll have about... or you're not muted, but I can't hear you. Oh, um, let's double check. Okay, I think they can hear me fine. So I might have to just message you the questions then if you can't hear me. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes though for our Q&A. So, I can't hear. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Someone's going to message you a question then. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. I can see your message now. <laughs> Are you able to hear me or see a question in your messages? Hmm, that's a good question. I know, wish you could hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, so the question is how important do you feel land back movement is not only to indigenous sovereignty, but to having sustainable, sustainable relationships with local ecology and global uh, environment. I think it's really important. I think, um, I know for a fact that indigenous people, our languages, our culture, our traditions, they are, I would almost say like, you know, there are experiments and science experiments that have been done over, you know, multiple generations and people have already made those mistakes, you know, and that's why we have those traditions and that's going to be our, our keys to, um, to healing ecology and creating uh, more sustainability globally. as well as over all uh, sustainable cultural practices by us being able to do what we need to do like burning. Um, we are 
not only benefiting our own selves, being able to obtain um, like basketry material, food, medicine. We're also creating healthy habitat. We're also um, helping the landscape as far as like, uh, if you're not having as much uh, big trees and, and uh, forbs and shrubs, you're not having as much uh, water being taken from nearby creeks. You're able to, to help your soil. You're able to help your, your water quality and not have as much competition on uh, single sources of water. And so that's really important as well. Um, yeah, fire safety, it's, it's huge. I know the fires that we've had here in Northern California, they literally affected the whole world. The whole world was um, breathing in smoke. And the more we fight fire with fire, we're going to be, we're going to be better. And it's because we haven't been able to burn. That's why we experience what we experience now. How do you see racial justice issues and land sovereignty connect? Well, a, a big reason why, um, particularly indigenous people in the United States, um, why we haven't been able to connect with our land is the way the system was created here in the United States. Uh, Native American people could not even be citizens, therefore could not vote, therefore could not own land, but yet, this is where we have always lived, but we've been categorically um, pushed out. And so when you're not able to, to have that base, like as like a citizen, you cannot be able to effectively fight for your rights. Um, however, we do have citizenship, but there is so much that was lost through um, the period of genocide and then the period of uh, assimilation and then um, I would say even the period of relocation of removing uh, people from their homelands into urban centers. And then by having people in urban centers, there was just this idea of, you know, Indian people just forget who they are and where they're from. And by doing so, you, you just don't care. You don't care about those spaces and those places. And I feel and that's kind of what we're doing right now. We're kind of doing like a resistance living. We're, we're staying in the space. We're staying on the river um, despite the, the deep embedded systemic poverty that we experience living on the reservation. Um, it is that important for tribal people to be able to live in a healthy way in their own communities, in their ancestral homes. How do you feel reservations are practicing or not practicing environmental and community stewardship? Let's see. Um, well, I know that we are doing it in a different kind of way. And I wouldn't even say it's necessarily the tribe um, necessarily because it really came from the people. And there, there is a difference and it's a little bit confusing sometimes because um, you can still be a tribal member um, or you can still be an, an, an indigenous person but not be a part of that tribe, but still you know, desire something different and be able to, to push that uh, governance as well. Um, I think that we've been doing really well these last few years. Um, we had a intertribal burn for the first time, we had the Yurok, Hoopa, and Karuk people come together and train each other and then burn. And so that was really positive. Um, some of the practices of uh, environmental and community stewardship I am uh, concerned about is uh, the, the carbon markets, because uh, I feel like it really goes a bit against of what we're doing as far as you know, lighting fires. Um, the idea is to accumulate carbon to 
you know, make this money, but really it's that whole system is, is not in alignment with how healthy ecosystems function. It's more about what looks good as far as to make money. And so I feel like that is pretty problematic, especially as things are drying, um, as we're running out of water and we're supposed to not touch these certain spaces because we need to accumulate carbon. I mean, that's just, it's, uh, it's frightening. It's, it's absolutely frightening. It just looks like a huge tinder box and we all want to do something about that. <laughs> What is the state of the wild salmon in the Klamath region? Well, um, they are struggling. Um, we are on the brink of extinction of the Chinook salmon. And I think a lot of people are kind of grappling with this idea of having one of the traditional foods in this area just no longer being available. Um, that is a really real situation. Uh, we did have some uh, water releases just like about a month ago, but the Chinook salmon and all other, you know, um, species of salmon, they require cold water to live. And uh, that's something that we did experience back in 2002. We had a huge fish kill, which basically um, in October of that year, um, because the temperature of the river got so warm, there was... Um, an increase in, of this little microbe called it, they called it an ick. And basically it's this little parasite that grows in the gills and those fish all suffocated in the water. And so it was a whole entire river with all these bellied up salmon on the sides. And so it's only gonna take a few more of those to be completely done with salmon on this river. So yeah, it's, uh, we need the water in the river and we need to be able to, at the same time, grow food more effectively and efficiently because where they're growing food in California, it's all coming from, from here on the Klamath River as well as the Owens Valley. How can non-Indigenous folks support tribal communities best in their efforts to both get land back and in land and water restoration processes? That's a great question. Um, what I would suggest is uh, support, like find out what uh, ancestral area that you live in and see about what uh, tribes are there and even nonprofits. I feel like the nonprofits in our area like uh, Save California Salmon, they're, they're really big on just like the, the action part and getting people to, um, you know, the, where we would do like a, like a, not public outreach, but we would, we put in public comments on, on projects, uh, things like that. That's the, one of the first steps I would suggest. Um, yeah, find out where you live, whose ancestral territory do you live in? And, um, and then the local uh, foundations in your area, I think would be really interesting to see what, what work they're doing to return land back. Um, looking at a really good example, well, some may say it's not so perfect, but an example of getting land back is here in Eureka, California. Eureka, California gave back uh, this island called a Tulwalamet. Uh, Indian Island uh, to the tribe, to the Wiat tribe. And um, well, part of it was, there was a history of a massacre there. And so all the people had, you know, died for the most part, except a few uh, children uh, had survived. And so there was no one that remained there on that island. And then what happened, it became like a shipping yard and then became like a super fun site. And after all the land was, um, you know, toxic, then the city, instead of uh, trying to fix it, then they gave it back. Um, at the same time, yes, it's kind of, um, it's a bittersweet moment that we ought tribe did return. Uh, they were, they had the Tualawit returned to them, um, 
but definitely scarred. Um, but it's a it's a first step, um, and I think they're they're the best ones to be able to have the process of healing that space uh, in a spiritual way, but also in a very physical way too. What is the next story you want to tell for the future in your area? What are the stories for of your elders you hold dear to that vision? How important is storytelling to future visioning? Mm. We, uh, we've had a lot of deaths this last year and uh, we had a really strong activist. Her name was Jeannie McCovey and she was a Yurok elder who was a um, paraplegic. And uh, one of the things that she told me was uh, one of the greatest gifts that we can do for people is uh, to observe them and to share with them what our observations of them are. Because so much of the time, we're not able to see ourselves for who we are. Sometimes that requires someone else to tell us um, what they see of us. And by doing so, uh, people can better understand like their purpose because in, in our world, um, people need that guidance from their elders, from their family to understand their purpose. Are you talking to them? Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and I think that's that's really important. The, the storytelling is is really critical. Mom, do I have a fairy thing suit for the sprinkler? Wait, hold on. I'll have you that later. I okay. have a fairy thing suit. All right, hold on. I don't think I have one though. And so in the story parts, the reason why it is so important is because this is the, this is the process of how um, knowledge is transferred. Yes, one of my uh, favorite authors is Dr. Kutcha Risling Baldi. Uh, she has this book called um, We Are Dancing For You. And it's about uh, indigenous feminism. And I found that that book really helpful, um, especially as being a, uh, a young mother it had me kind of recognize like the steps that we needed to do as far as our world renewal ceremonies and being able to uplift our females in those voices. controlled burns. Do you think the lack of that is one of the problems with the fires in California? Um, I don't think we have enough controlled burns, to be honest. We don't have enough cultural or controlled burns, period. And sometimes to get the permits to do it is a little bit uh, tricky sometimes uh, just to get through the county or the tribe or whoever you have to get to in order to do the burns um, because cities and governments are so afraid of fire. And yet at the same time, we, we really need to be trained on how to do this more effectively. I, I think we saw that definitely a few years ago uh, in Santa Rosa where, I mean, they even lost their hospital. So it's, it's time that we, we take these, these tools that we have um, because of the state of California has always adapted to fire and even our plants, they, they require it. Some of our plants are serotonous, which means they need fire in order to crack open that seed. Um, it's, it's needed here on the ground.
Okay. So that was our final question. Thank you, Priscilla, for um, all those answers. And thank you to everyone who submitted a question that wraps up our Q&A. Thank you again, Priscilla, for being with us here today. Mm, thank you so much. <laughs>